Okay, we'll get started. Glad you're all here this morning. Lovely fall day. It's cooler outside, but it's warmer in here. <laughs> We're going to continue our study in Hebrews, um, where we've been looking at the uh, superiority of this last age messenger over God's messengers from the Old Testament, the angels and the prophets. And so far we've been looking mostly at the first chapter of Hebrews where we have been given seven reasons, at least seven, that this latter day messenger is superior because of his relationship to God He's the only begotten, and he is the heir of all things. He is God's glory. He is God, John says. Um, he is the essence of what God is and shows us exactly what God is. He is the creator of all things, and in him all things are held together or consist or are in order. And he is the sin remover. Um, This makes him superior to all others. No one else could remove sin. Uh, we looked at Colossians 1, verse 30. We looked at 1 Corinthians 1, 30, as well as Isaiah's description of the Messiah in Isaiah 53. He, by his stripes, we are healed. God laid our sin upon him and if one is a ruler over all creation, he is superior. And this messenger rules all from a divinely appointed position at God's right hand. And finally, because in the spirit world, names have great power. And maybe they do here, it's just we aren't aware of it, that God is. This messenger is superior because his name, as it says in Ephesians chapter 1, 21, his name is is above every other name in this world and in the world to come or in this age and in the age to come. Um, he is superior. And we also referenced Philippians 2, 9. Uh, his name is greater than any other name. And Hebrews 1, 4, of course, where it mentions this out of the book we are studying. And we're on point number seven, wrapping up our discussion of his superior name. Before we get into that, a little aside, I know we never do those, but I'll make an exception today. Um, any of you heard anything about anything going on in the Middle East? The Middle East, as opposed to. Place where they always fight over there? Yeah, yeah. For thousands of years? You know, it's interesting because you're here, I don't know, if you turn into onto any of the commentary radio stations and maybe even some of the TV stations, I don't watch TV, but uh, you hear a lot about how this is possibly fulfilling a scripture or, or whatever. And. Uh, I was uh, listening to Bot Radio on my drive over to Menard yesterday and uh, before as well. And of course they were talking about um, the hat is hung on Hebrews 11, not Hebrews, Romans 11, 26. Why don't you turn to some passages here because I want us to look at these because this has to do with whether the Jewish system is still in effect as the Jews were claiming and the Jews said, well, this, this Christianity is an add-on or whether there was a cessation of one and a beginning of another, which is what Hebrews is all about. In Romans 11, 
verse 25 and 26, Paul has been talking about earlier in the chapter about the old law and how people can't be made right by the old law. And he says, I want you to understand this secret, brothers and sisters, so you will understand that you do not know everything. Part of Israel has been made stubborn, and that will change when many who are not Jews, the Gentiles, have come to God. And that is how all Israel will be saved. There's the key. There's the key that all this is hanging on. Now, will there be a great revival in Israel at some point? I don't know. But... It is written in the scriptures, the Savior will come from Jerusalem. He will take away all evil from the family of Jacob. If all of Israel is to be saved, and it's a physical Israel. See, this is the same problem the apostles had. Well, Lord, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Jerusalem? If the, all Israel is going to be saved, then this passage in Matthew 7, verse 13, does not make sense. Enter through, and it's by the messenger. It's by the son. It's by Jesus Christ. Enter through the narrow gate. The gate is wide and the road is wide that leads to hell. And many people go through that gate, but the gate is small and the road is narrow that leads to true life. Only a few people find that road. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jews. All of Israel is going to be saved? Really? I think we have to, um, and in this commentary that was on the radio, this viewpoint that we espoused was being disparaged because they said Christianity did not replace the Jews. The Christianity was grafted onto the Jews. Well, yes, it was, but you missed the point because he's still not talking about a physical Israel. Um, Peter says in 1 Peter 2, if you want to turn over there, we're going to read 9 and 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. He talks about, and Peter's talking about people. He says that we're not a nation, but now are a nation. So obviously this is Gentiles, but you are, in verse 9, but you are a chosen people, royal priests, a holy nation. What nation? The nation of heaven, of the new Israel, of the spiritual Israel, right? People of God's own possession. You were chosen to tell about the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. At one time you were not a people, but now you are God's people. In the past you had never received mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. And one more and then we'll get off of this. Go over to Ephesians chapter 2, if you would. Because... Paul deals with this in multiple books. If he wrote Hebrews, again, we don't know that he did, but if he wrote Hebrews, he deals with it there. He deals with it in Romans. He deals with it in um, Ephesians. He deals with it in Galatians. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 15. He's been talking about the old system, the old Jewish law. The Jewish law had many commands and rules. But Christ ended that law. His purpose was to make the two groups of people, he's been talking about there's a great separation, the Jews on one side, the Gentiles on the other. His purpose was to make the two groups of people become one new people in him and in this way make peace. It was also God's purpose to end the hatred between the two groups, to make them into one body and to bring them back to God. Christ did all this with his death on the cross. Christ came and preached peace. To you who were far away from God, the Gentiles, and to those who were near to God, the Jews. Yes, it is through Christ we all have the right to come to the Father in one spirit. Now, you who are not Jewish are not foreigners or strangers any longer. 
but are citizens together with God's holy people. Citizens of what? Citizens of the nation of Israel. Citizens of the nation, spiritual nation of God. The spiritual Israel. You belong to God's family. You are like a building and God's family. I mean, we're going to look at that here in chapter 2 of Hebrews. You are like a building that was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So in that sense, yes, Paul says, so doesn't it make, in Romans, is it just worthless to have been a Jew? He says, no. We had all that history. We had all that teaching. We had all that instruction. All that relationship with God. You are like a building that was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself is the most important stone in that building. And that whole building is joined together in Christ. He makes it grow and become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Christ, you too are being built together with the Jews into a place where God lives through the Spirit. And this is one of those things that we've talked about multiple times, uh, not only when I was teaching, but others. And if you take a particular scripture and you hang your hat on that and you make that the thing you're going to hold on to and ignore everything else that talks about these things, well, you're going to go down these rabbit holes that have no light at the end of the tunnel. No light. All right, moving. Were the angels... Superior to the prophets to whom they delivered their messages? <coughs> were they? Yeah, they were. The angels were superior to the prophets. And yet the, the writer's declaring this one, this messenger, this son is much superior to the angels. He is above everything except the Father. Um, Joe, do you want to read uh, Hebrews 1, 4 through 6, please? Is that me? Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, 4 yes. through 6. Yes, please. Having become as much superior to the angels as the name, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? I will, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Okay, so this designation, this name, my son, places him above all other beings. And we've got multiple uh, occurrences in the New Testament where God says, this is my son. The baptism of Christ by John. The Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, Peter says, well, let's build three. No, 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 no. One, if you're going to build anything, you listen to my son. He's the only one worthy to be listened to here. It designates this messenger's place as part of God's very being. My son. If, if, if you say this, I want you to meet my son. Well, you're talking about someone who is of you, has your DNA, has your flesh and blood, right? Part of God's very being, since, but since he is not now flesh and blood, he just is. He said, I am. I am. Notice even the Father refers to his only Son, why don't you go ahead and read uh, verses 8 and 10, if you would, Jody, since you're there. He refers to his only son as God, in verse 8, and Lord, in verse 10. Verse 8. 
But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of, of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. In verse 10, You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth and the beginning and the heavens are the work of your hands. Okay, and that's God talking about this messenger, this one who is his son. So if the purpose of the angels in verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 1 is to serve God, of course they're going to worship him as God's very being, as God's son. So right from the start, the writer of this book wants to establish by ticking off multiple points and quoting multiple Old Testament scriptures how God's messenger in these last days from verses uh, 1 or 2 is completely superior to any other messengers who have come before and is superior to any who might come subsequent to the sons being here in the flesh. Paul's statement that we read in Galatians 1, 8 through 9 reinforces that. You remember what that says? Even if we or an angel... Go ahead. If, if they bring a different, a message different than what has been right. taught. Let him be accursed. Yep. So, this messenger is superior to angels. If you have an angel that appears to you and says something different from what he said, don't pay attention. It's definitely not from the Holy Spirit. Any Latter-day messenger who delivers any ideas or thoughts not in Christ's message, Paul says, needs to be condemned. The Son is the superior messenger, and the Son's message is the superior message. And it's the final. In these last days, our God has spoken to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. He's the final messenger. Lord, in the beginning, so God says, Lord, who's talking about? Jesus. Yes. In the beginning, you made the earth, and your hands made the skies. They will be destroyed, but you will remain. You never change. Your life will never end. His message stands. Nothing that comes subsequent is of importance. It's his message. To me, chapter 1 of Hebrews is as foundational to the spirit world as Genesis 1 is to the physical world. We see a lot of folks who want to cast shadow or cast doubt on the creation story in Genesis. No, there was this big explosion. No, it's millions. Of... And by the same token, there are many who would cast doubt on the account in Hebrews chapter 1. Do you see all that? Do you see that, how important that is? Both of those situations. Hebrews 1 is, in, is as important to the spirit world as Genesis 1 is to the physical world. Does that make sense? Okay. And if these basics are not understood or are ignored, then everything that follows is foolishness, it seems, by human reasoning. Actually, the one that's reasoning is the foolish person. Uh, and if you understand this first chapter of Hebrews... It's pretty straightforward. No other gods or messages differing from Christ matter. Not Buddha. Not Gandhi. Not Brahma. Not Confucius. Not Joseph Smith. Not Karl Marx. Not John Calvin. Not Martin Luther. Not John Wesley. Not Mary Baker Eddy. Not William Miller, who I guess was one of the founders of the Baptist Church. 
not the Quran nor Muhammad, not the Pope, not anyone else, not any other message. Only Jesus' words and message, which he learned from God the Father. He says, I don't, I don't speak out of my own store. I speak what the Father has taught me. I speak what the Father tells me to say. I do what my Father has taught me. <coughs> Only those matter. It's, it's interesting. You, know, you talk about these verses here where God, God talks about who Christ is. Mm -hmm. If you take that as truth, then you also have to take it as truth to when Christ says he says he is who he is. Yes. And, and and the two together, Christ talks a lot about who he is. Right. You, you meld the two together, you get a big picture of who he is. And I'd have to look it up, but he does say in one place, if you reject me and who I say I am, you reject the Father. Did anyway, they thought it was his uh, angel. <laughs> Seems to say maybe that they yeah. do. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's why that's why we've got spouses and so forth to keep them from doing stupid stuff. Right. They, they are. And but it also gives us insight, like you say, he he lays out the the spirit on the spiritual realm, there's different functions. It's that they're servants, that's what they are, and they're mm -hmm. superior. God has given them certain things, but yet they are still servants as well. And if you really can dig deep into that last statement, how much is he loved us that he would do all of these things? He would actually send his son, the, the superior one, to die for these lowly, but his the ones he loved. Yep. It's 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 a, actually there's a lot going on in that first little bit there. Yes, there is. So, superior messenger, now we're going to jump into chapter 2, verse 4, superior message. Uh, God also testified to the truth of the message by using wonders, signs, many kinds of miracles, by giving people gifts. So, again... Repetition is the mother of skill, at least always on the sun. Christ is superior because he is the only begotten. He is the heir. He is God's glory. He is exactly who God is. He is the creator of all things and keeps it all together. He is the sin remover. Nobody else can remove those sins. He rules in a divinely appointed position, is sat down at the right hand of the son of the throne of God. His name is greater than all other heavenly sons in certain passages it alludes to the angels as sons of God. Um, okay, so the message. If that's the case, all these things. Don, you want to read Hebrews 2, 1 through 3. Please. For this reason, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, so that we will not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through the angel is proven unalterable, and every transgression and every disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first, after it was at the first spoken through was confirmed to us by those who heard. Okay. What's this in verse 1? What's this? Uh, do you 
have drifting in your? Yeah, drift. Okay. Uh, so that uh, what you have heard, so that we may not drift. Away yes. From okay. What's this warning about drifting away referring to? Dr drifting, drifting away from what? And, and Doug said the message. Um, the message, some translations say the truth, drifting away from the truth. truth of, the message of what? The, mes the truth of what? Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus, right? It's all about Jesus. We sing about Jesus is the rock in the weary land. We sing about, well, your anchor holding is talking about being anchored in Christ. We sing about hide me in the rock that is higher than I. Jesus is the anchor that keeps us holding on to the truth because he is, oh, he is the truth, right? Jesus is the one on whom we must keep our gaze so that we do not slip into anything else, anything less, anything Different from this latter day message, whether it's the Mosaical law, the prophets, or a perversion of what Jesus taught, Islam, or you pick, you pick anything besides Jesus Christ's message. Just Jesus. Think about this audience of Jews to whom many. Uh, of course, these are believers, but they came from this background. He's just a carpenter's son. How can he be the son of God? We know who he is. We know where he came from. This book of Hebrews was written to these believers because they came from that background. Yes, they have accepted Christ as their Savior, but what caused the generation who came out of Egypt to lose the promised land. I mean, they all at one time, they followed Moses. They followed him right out of Egypt. They followed him right up to the edge of the Dead Sea, of the Red Sea. And then all of a sudden, oh, what are we going to do? We're trapped. What are, you doing? what are we going to do? They followed him across the Red Sea through water piled up on each side on dry land. And they watched Pharaoh and his army be destroyed. Wasn't it? They lost the promised land. Wasn't it because they didn't follow the instructions and the leadership of Moses? How often was there rebellion against Moses? There was Aaron and Miriam. There was Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. There was, I mean, it's like, no wonder God said, I'm done, I'm done. Moses, let's just, you and me, we'll, we'll get this. They were looking back to Egypt. They were looking to the golden calf idol. They were looking at the giants in Canaan. Oh, we can't, we can't. They were looking at their physical needs. Well, did we come out here to die? At least in Egypt we had cucumbers. Yeah, right. We might have had whips on our backs, but at least we had cucumbers and leeks and onions. They weren't looking at their Savior. They weren't looking at the one who provided their salvation, their deliverer, God. Did they suffer because of their unbelief? And from ignoring the messenger of God, did they suffer? They took their eyes from Jesus. They took their eyes from God and they lost their future. Their future got canceled. It slipped away from them. It drifted away from them. And that's what this verse 1, don't let it drift. Keep if, if this message received from angels was not paid attention to and they were punished, 
How much more severe are we deserving if we let this slip away from us, if we drift away from keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ? And we'll talk some more about that in chapter 3. Um, so, the writer has established the credentials of this latter-day messenger and points out if the old message received at the mouth of the inferior message messengers was ignored, the old message, inferior messengers, those ignoring it were deserving of punishment. So since this messenger is far superior to those prior messengers and his message is far superior to theirs, there are definitely going to be consequences for ignoring his message and the gift of salvation he brought. Um, in one passage, I think it's Romans, it says they counted... Or maybe it's in uh, Peter. They counted the blood of Jesus as not anything different than anything else. Somewhere, if, I'm not sure. If you've known the truth, you've been taught, you believe, you turn back, you turn away from it, it's been better for you not to be known it from the beginning. Peter, yeah. Okay. yeah. First Peter, I believe it's it is. pretty serious, yeah. Yes, indeed. And you look at the timelines as what you're talking about. These are... These are probably, they're in the same, close to the same generation. Some of them would have actually, would have been close to or seen Christ at some time. Some mm -hmm. of them very well could mm -hmm. have. So, but what they're, they're, this message that they're hearing is if they heard Christ in person or the inspired teachers and apostles, that's where they would have gotten this message from. Yeah. So, but they're already, they're a first generation. They're, they're first, maybe second, but they're already, they're having to warn them, do not drift. That's how fast this stuff can happen. Like you say, Moses, they just come through the Red Sea. They're going on toward um, the mountain, and already they're grumbling on that journey. I mean, it was, I don't know, you know, weeks to months. Right. And they're already grumbling. Yeah. And rebelling. And, well, who chose you to lead us? I mean, what, what, what right have you got to have to say here? Yeah. But that's what a lot of people don't, don't realize is the retribution. Have you ever talked to anyone who said, well, we're all, we're all serving the same God? That's what we're talking about here right now. We're talking about, no, there is one. He is superior. You don't diverge from his message because it's not the same God if your God is any different from what this messenger delivered. You know, and, and all you have to do is look at some of the people uh, that are being called. Yeah. You know, what was it that Marty Luther said? Do not call anything by my name or, or name anything after me. I'm not worthy of that. Yeah. What did they do? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, he didn't really mean that. I'm sure he did. Well, and John, he goes back even further than that. John, Jesus' cousin, said, you know, I there's somebody coming after me. I'm not he's gonna I'm diminished, he'll he'll increase. So yeah. Alright. So in this first chapter there has been no mention of Christ as a superior sacrifice. He's been the superior messenger and the superior having the superior message. He's not been mentioned as a superior high priest. That's yet to come. Okay? These points are made later. And yet we know it was Christ's blood that took away the sins of the world. I started from way back in Isaiah. Uh, the blood of God in human form. And what if this gift is rejected? As I just mentioned a little bit ago, I think it's Peter. Or the authenticity of the Son is doubted. So, after developing this idea of Christ as not just a superior messenger, but also as um, 
a superior sacrifice and superior priest. We're going to jump over that for just a moment. The writer expands on this idea of the severity of punishment for those who deny Christ's superiority in every way. Uh, Doug, you want to read Hebrews 10, 28, and uh, through 31, please? So again, we're jumping over these the superior sacrifice, the superior high priest, but it's because it relates to this first verse here in chapter 2 about rejecting the message. 10, 28, through 30. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who was who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who was has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Okay. So this writer wants to make it very clear, abundantly clear. He's saying these things multiple times. And you're hearing me repeat things multiple times, but he repeats them multiple times throughout the book. Um, There are grave consequences if one rejects God's gift of his son. The superior messenger with a superior message a superior sacrifice, a superior high priest, um, and there's no place to turn if you don't turn towards God. If he is the sacrifice, and you reject that sacrifice, there's nothing. And I think I've got a discussion over at West Union that if you blaspheme against God, you cannot be forgiven. Because some are Holy Spirit, yeah. Yeah, well, maybe this is what you're doing if you, if you turn your back on this. That's what that's talking about to me. Yeah, you're saying it's not just comes out of your mouth. Right. Like, oh, God, you're never going to be forgiven for that. Yeah. What we're talking about right here is the way I understand it. Yeah, it's a blasphemy is a mockery or uh, just uh, trying to degrade something. And if you mock this, we're, again, we're the alternative here. It's like you're standing, there's one path off this high mountain here, and you you can either take that path or you're going to fall. Well, so in the end, what is, that is, that is, that's where it's going to be. That's, that's the hard thing, I think, for people to digest. It's either going to be well done or take it away, away. Depart from me. Depart from yeah. me, yeah. I mean, and that, that's really hard for people to digest because that ultimately that's going to be the point. That's going to be the choice someday. And can be on this side of it where you accept or you can be on the other side of it where you reject and trample on your foot right well the the, the wording here uh, uh, that uh, made them holy as no different from others blood who insult the spirit of God's grace uh, you know an insult to the spirit this uh, ESV says outrage yeah. the spirit. Or blasphemy. Uh, you know, those those terms are, are uh, uh, pretty inclusive of things that shouldn't ever be done. Right. Leonard, do you want to get over to Deuteronomy 19 for me? And we'll have you read here in a little bit Deuteronomy 19. 15, verse 15. So, here he says that all the New Testament writers testified to the veracity and the authenticity of this messenger's superior message. And so did God. How does Scripture say that something is established as fact? Generally, I yeah, Hebrew or uh, Deuteronomy nineteen fifteen, please. A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of an iniquity or any sin which he has committed. 
on the evidence of two or three witnesses that matter shall be confirmed. Okay. So something is established. There, that was their legal system. That's their, this is, we're talking about a legal system here. Something is established as truth, as fact, if two or three witnesses. So this standard is also referenced here in Hebrews 10, 28. Anyone who refused to obey is found guilty from the proof given by two or three witnesses. So we're looking, if this message is to be confirmed as truth, then we need some witnesses, right? Um, and it even talks about false witnesses yes. in, that, in that same context. So, um, Ron, I'm going to have you uh, in just a little bit read Hebrews 2, 2 uh, Hebrews 2, verse 3 and 4. So, um, who testified to the validity of this message? This New Testament delivered by this latter day messenger. Yeah. First of all, the Son, then his eyewitnesses, and lastly, God through the Spirit. Um, Hebrews, those verses, Ron, if you would, please. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. And God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Okay, so Lord himself told us about it. Those who heard him testified it was true. God himself testified to the truth of it through the Holy Spirit doing marvelous miracles. Do you recall what Philip requested when John, Jesus is talking about I'm going to be going away and, and so do you remember what Philip said? Well, he, uh, that was one of the questions. Another was, we'll be happy if you just show us the Father. And part of the reply is in John chapter 14, when Jesus says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. So here he's saying, you know, accept who I am. I'm the superior messenger. I'm the Son. I am the one who's going to be sitting at the right hand. Or else believe me for the sake of the works. The Holy Spirit testified as to the veracity of the message by the works. Believe for the sake of the works. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, and the greater works than these he will do. Okay. So... This all ties together. We've got three witnesses and Jesus reminding in another place, you know, the, one of those witnesses is the Holy Spirit. I did all these works. If you don't believe who I am, you're not going to believe one witness. At least believe this witness. Okay? We'll quit. Um, there. And I have uh, a... I'm going to be gone the next two weeks, so Jody has graciously agreed to um, teach the next two weeks, and then we'll pick up there in verse 5 of chapter 2 when I come back. Thank you for your comments and your participation.